Hey there. Welcome to episode 12 of the Artist in Me is Dead podcast. I'm your host, Rhonda Willers. This final episode of season one features a conversation with Zahara Hushiar, an interdisciplinary artist based in Northern California, who describes herself as constantly stuck in diasporic liminal spaces. Zahara and I met at Anderson Ranch Arts Center, where she was working as a ceramics intern. She was my workshop assistant for a week-long Teresa Gelato workshop, which we can now fondly refer to as T-Siggy, thanks to Zahara. She's one of those people who feels like magic when you meet her. She engages with the desire to be fully submerged in the wholeness of life. Zahara is a first-generation Iranian-American who was born and raised in West Virginia to a cute and short pair of Iranian immigrants. We recorded this episode on the day her BFA thesis show opened. She is graduating from the University of California, Davis, with a degree in studio art and a minor in Persian studies. And as you'll hear from our conversation, Zahara is a human containing multitudes of experiences and knowledge. Please enjoy this episode with Zahara Hushiar. Well, hi, Zahra. I'm so thrilled to be talking to you today. Hello, Rhonda. I am also <laughs> so thrilled to be talking to you. <laughs> um, this is so fun. I want to share just a little bit of how you and I came to know each other, too, because it's kind of you. I was teaching at Anderson Ranch Arts Center last summer, and mm-hmm. you were my workshop assistant. And I just like instantly felt your magic, I guess is how I would describe it. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And I remember, I think you asked me about like, what you're like, I don't know why they asked me to do this. There was like some event, Mm -hmm. social event. And I said, I know why it's because you are like so warm and engaging. Like, this is why you get asked. (laughs) Yes, that was definitely, I could not be happier that I was paired up with you for that. Like, I think it was you. And then there was another teacher at the same time. And Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, I, I mean, other teacher was great, but I like got the bag. Like I was so (laughs) excited. I immediately was like, you were so easy to talk to so funny and so like happy and welcoming in your class and like I think the I think like the first night we even like shared I mean past the like you know obligatory like class welcome dinner and then the next time we like sat together and we like Mm -hmm. broke bread together and I was (laughs) like wow like I love her so much and then we got T Siggy down. And I remember that was like such a good moment of like, our worlds are like mending together. (laughs) It's so true. Well, it was very, it was a very reciprocated love. I will say. So much. That was such a great week. Such a great week. It was. And I feel so lucky that we got to know each other through that experience. And then have continued to stay in touch and like getting to follow you and like see your work is just like I find you so inspiring with the vigor with which you go to your work and that you explore. And I can't wait, like, cause we get to talk about all of that today. And that's so fun for me. And then I also wanted to share too, before we get started, part of why I asked you to do this with me is because for this first season, all the other guests were people who have already graduated with BFAs or been through some sort of formal art academic training and then have been outside of it for like this five to 10 year kind of time Mm -hmm. span. And you, my friend, (laughs) are graduating and you have your (laughs) thesis show tonight. Yes. And I just, I'm so excited because I want to hear what it's, what your perspective is at this Mm -hmm. juncture, like from Mm -hmm. this place of just not, it's not like just starting, but you're taking this next step and you're moving into a different space and And so how about for today, let's start with, um, if you can tell us how you came to be like studying art and like your path before that and what, what got you here and where you are too, I guess you could share that too in the process. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, first off, I'm here in the beautiful town of Davis, California, super cute cows are everywhere, temperate, nice weather, you know, it's a good time. It's a (laughs) perfect like college town like I feel like like this is the college town they make the like cool move out 
it's like almost too picturesque I'm like what's going on (laughs) and so my but my path here was definitely it was a weird zigzaggy all over the place roller coaster definitely a very unconventional transfer student (laughs) I I love an unconventional transfer student (laughs) very unconventional I'm like I was surprised that they even took me honestly like I thought they would look at my transcript and be like this chick's a flight risk (laughs) This was like not my first attempt at university. I was like, (laughs) I tried so many times, dropped out so many times, went and did different things all over the place. So it all started born and raised in West Virginia. I'm and definitely I think that I mean, I think maybe there is something, you know, in my blood, in my ancestry that made me want to be an artist because mm-hmm. my my dad's side of the family is all artistic. Like I'm Iranian. So art's kind of like we're like about that life. You know? <laughs> and so art has always been something I, I loved. I knew I wanted to do. And I but I don't know. I was in a place that I, I didn't really know how to. I was, you know, little brown kid in a little white town and I was like I want to go explore and see the world and Mm -hmm. so I went to I actually first went to an art art school like a only art school in Mm -hmm. Chicago it was the school of the art institute Mm -hmm. of Chicago Mm -hmm. and um I think I just there I mean a lot of things happened while I was there like a lot of things all (laughs) from like academic mishaps to like life mishaps to Mm -hmm everything that could have gone wrong basically went wrong and I was Mm -hmm. like okay this is clearly like not the time for me right now and Mm -hmm. so regrettably but not regrettably like now but yeah at the time I was so sad but I was like yeah I gotta drop out and Mm -hmm. so I dropped out of there I started being a little bit more I was trying to you know build a more healthy intentional life that Mm -hmm. at the age of like 18 to like <laughs> 19 I did not care about at all so I moved <laughs> back home to West Virginia and that's when I started um I went to I went to my uh my doctor and she like got me in contact with someone um because I told her a bit I you know dropped out of art school I was like what was me my purpose for life gone what do I do mm, like yeah. no reason to be out here anymore I should just blend in with the moss you know like I had no idea what I was gonna do so I was like I'm done and she was like whoa hold up now drama queen like have you ever tried have you ever farmed before like maybe you'll find some like purpose in life and farming and I was like that's weird like why would I farm <laughs> like yeah. who the hell farms <laughs> and then I was just like you are like I'm like why are you telling me to do this it was such a like jarring uh, like idea for me because yeah was such a, like feels you know, random like, yeah random and I was like I was like I want to be an artist in New York City and like you know Mm -hmm. take on the like contemporary art world and then she was like maybe you need to like farm and I was like okay (laughs) (laughs) I was like whatever so then I got in contact with this farm in West Virginia Round Right Farm and I like instantly fell in love day one I was there I started working there living there it was the best time Mm. ever And eventually I was there for a while, but I realized like, you know, I mean, it, a beautiful lifestyle. I was finally like intentionally living and like, I felt that really like my, like my being on earth was like one that was like filled with like abundance of love in all sorts of ways, you know? Mm -hmm, And I was like, mm -hmm. this is a beautiful time, but I don't think like have to think like economically like I don't really think I can like support myself as like a farm hand you know yeah like so then I had this idea of well like when I think of like sustainable agriculture because that was that farm was like a organic um sorry regenerate I just ate breakfast regenerative (laughs) like farm (laughs) I'm like tasting my toast (laughs) so we were and I was like okay I love this like I want to learn more about this so in my mind like the mecca for you know like sustainable agriculture was California Mm -hmm. like little West Virginia kid had like never gone to California before I was like I I genuinely like I will never forget my idea of California was like 
everyone lives in some sort of beachside sat like shack and there's like driftwood everywhere <laughs> and like fishing nets and like basically like the set for like aquamarine the movie about the mermaid <laughs> i was like that's california and like ocean avenue by yellow card is playing on non-stop <laughs> like, california <laughs> lifestyle <laughs> and like it kind of was that like when i was down in san diego but here in davis yeah. i'm like no what not even <laughs> no it's like I could be back in West Virginia and I wouldn't know, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, but it was, fun and it was so great. So I went out, I moved out to California about like five, five ish to six ish years now. I've been okay. out here and I lived and worked in San Diego. Um, I moved in with an aunt at the time. And I just kind of like, I don't know, I had this, you know, moment of that I feel like a lot of young artists go through where you're like, art, like, do I really want to dedicate my life to this? Like, this is scary. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I didn't even really even know what I was that like, at the time, I never even touched clay before, which like mm -hmm. now is like my life. I like love ceramics <laughs> never even touched clay I was like strictly painting like weird paintings and I don't even know what I was doing like found object sculptures kind of but not much the way that I do now but more so like here's this like weird rat skull I found and I put it in this wooden box and like I, it was like weird art yeah I was like what am I doing you know yeah and so I just uh mm. kind of it was terrifying and I was like do I want to so for a while I didn't go back to school I just kind of worked and then I eventually went to a community college and that's when I started working with clay a lot um mm. I went to Palomar College down in San Marcos, California, which has an amazing ceramics program. Mm. And I had a great professor there, Sasha Kuzel, and she really like made me realize how magical ceramics can be. Mm. And I think that's when I started thinking like, and I started working at a ceramic studio, like just very like haphazard like it just kind of you know like when you start doing the things that like you love like mm -hmm. things just fall into place so you they don't start popping up it. right opportunities yeah. just start you're like there just it is there, there it is mm -hmm. there yeah. it is like oh it's right there this whole time like you don't realize mm -hmm. it until you like just kind of it's weird like I let go of like the pressure I was putting on myself and as soon as I did that I think things began to come towards me you know yeah and it yeah. was like this just this like not total like lack of like I don't care anything that happens like it was very much so like a like I'm gonna participate fully in everything that I do and whatever yeah. happens happens and like yeah. suddenly that's when like the wealth started coming into my, like wealth yeah. in life not wealth yeah. of money but <laughs> yeah. that's when it I like started coming into my life and I was like holy crap like I think I can do this now and yeah so I went, I went to Palomar, I got my, um, I get C, which is like the transfer guarantee um, type of pathway you can do at community colleges in California. That's cool. kind of like super rad, super like, you, they don't tell you these things, you know, yeah. like when you're in Yeah, tell school. us, like, tell, tell more about this. Yeah, so you, it was amazing. Yeah. So it's like, it's this program there, there was two, but I get C's were for if you want to, I think, go to any of the UC schools. And then there was mm -hmm. another one that was if you want to go to the CSU schools, mm -hmm. which now I learn I probably should have gone to a CSU because making ceramics and just making art in general on a quarter system is, mm -hmm. oh. has, I am like, I am, and I think that's what had made my like work vigor like alive yeah. is because you have to just bust things out like week after week. And mm -hmm. that was, I wish someone would have told me that, but you know what? Wish could have, would have, should have. I don't like to live that way. <laughs> yeah. And so, <laughs> and so you're sharing yeah, it guess, now as a PSA for others. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. For anyone out there, if you're hearing this, if you're interested in art, really think about are you ready to like bust things out at like quarter system pace? Like, where it's like, <laughs> like one week for each project. Wow. Like maybe if you're lucky, like two weeks, you know? Wow. So you're working fast. You're working like ideas, 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 which it's great if you, so I, I'll get into that later. Yeah. But if you want to take like non-art classes, it's amazing because you can mm -hmm. learn so many things. And, mm. and I'll get into that later of how I think like coming to Davis was such a great idea for me, but so mm -hmm. going back to the I get see it's 
a really amazing and I, I'm not sure if it's something that every state has but I know in California yeah. it's like this almost like a roadmap of like these are the classes you need to take these are the electives you gotta get this is how long it'll take you and if you do blah 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 like your chances of getting into xyz school is higher that's so awesome. It's, it's, it's so amazing. It's so amazing. And I am really thankful for the advisors I had back there. Mm. And I, I had finished my Agetsi. And then that was when I tend to do this thing. Oh, oh I tend <laughs> to do this thing <laughs> where um, I love to just have like quarter life crises all the time. And so I had my like <laughs> all the time. My, all the time, you know. At the at this point I think I should just call it a crisis, but that <laughs> makes it sound so like Yeah, heavy. what it Yeah, tell us about what it is. So is it it's, like a, just a moment of real is like of reflecting, mm, like deep reflecting mm, on your or like fast like what happens during this time? It's it's like this moment of I think reflecting of of taking in and absorbing, of realizing mm -hmm. like, oh my God, like, wow, I'm really interested in this, but I just saw this and now I'm really interested in this. And mm -hmm. I'm realizing the older I get, like maybe it's just like a really severe side effect of like having ADHD, you know? And so I think <laughs> I just like want to do everything all the time. And so yeah. after I had finished at Palomar, I had like quarter life crisis number one. And that was like, oh, I finished this thing to go to art school. You know what? What? I'm a farmer. I was like, <laughs> what? That's crazy. I am a farmer. I have to go to farm school. And so then I went to a sustainable urban agriculture program in San Diego City College. And then before <laughs> that, I took a couple of classes at Miracosta College in Oceanside, just because I was like, eh, why not? Next yeah. Summer. Let's Try it and see. This. Yep. Yeah. And then I was like, eh, okay, I'm over that. And then I what were those classes league. that you took at that college in the summer? It was it was like a um, color theory class and a uh, 2D like drawing class. Okay, that was it. Was they were pretty interesting. The color theory was really helpful. Um, yeah, but they were just I think they were like classes I needed to fulfill the I get C that I like mm -hmm. couldn't get at Palomar so then I was mm -hmm. like okay I'll just get it at Miracosta and then I'll like go and go to like art school and then mm -hmm. I did that and then I decided no actually what's art school like farm school and farm school farm school <laughs> like, that was amazing and I'm forever so thankful that I did that because so what did you learn there like what was mm -hmm. what was your yeah tell I want to I'm, I'm like curious day day? yeah I'm oh like what God. yeah what kind of classes do you take and what did Honda, you yeah. they were amazing <laughs> classes they were so much fun like our classroom it was so the thing I loved about this program was like it was like getting out of because I'm I was so afraid that I was going to go to like a STEMI like read a textbook and make yeah. graphs type of thing and like <laughs> I can't do that yeah. my brain does not function that way and so then I got there and it's so hands-on like our everyday classes would be we would like go to this classroom you know write a little bit in our journals look at a couple graphs not too many to overwhelm my small brain but a couple <laughs> graphs <laughs> my small like science your brain, brain is very capable <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> and then after that we would like it so this was in downtown San Diego so okay. it was an urban space and it was after like being in the classroom we would like go to one location to go get our like wheelbarrows shovels like all the things that we want to take to the farm and then we'll like go downtown walking with all of our things and go to the farm space and it was <laughs> every day was just spent outside like mm. real real like hands in the soil like getting in down and dirty with everything I learned like soil science which I never thought I would ever know in my life and it's like a fast I took one class in soil science because I went to an egg school too and I had a double major for a while mm -hmm. and it was so fascinating it's to learn so about soil yeah. yes it was and great I think as ceramicist like it directly yes. like talks to what we do you know totally yeah like, so much like, relationship so many and that's when I started it was really down there that I started realizing like I occupy this space that I think like I need to realize like how much more important like I didn't think of it as so like wow like these two things I'm so passionate about like really conversate with each other at mm -hmm. the moment I was like hey yeah I like to make art and then I like to farm and then two I, separate like, things two separate things and I had this idea like I was a very like black and white thinker that I was like oh well 
now I'm in farm school. Art is dead. I will <laughs> never touch art again. I'm like, I killed it. The artist in me is dead. And I, like, <laughs> and I was like, afterwards, I was like, actually, that is so silly. I love her. She needs to come back to life. <laughs> and so then I started applying to all of these schools. I had, oh, but then I had finished at the, um, San Diego and I got like a, I got a whole entire degree in like sustainable yeah. urban agriculture and I was like I started like I got a I had a job interview for this place that was like um super interesting so they go to commercial spaces and some residential spaces and they just like take over the lawn space and grow food there and they like take care of it they harvest for you they process for you and that's it like you just pay the service for them and Wow. I remember they, I remember um, during my interview, they were like, oh, wow, like, we're really impressed. I think you're hired. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to work here for three months, though, because then I'm going to university. And they were like, what? <laughs> like, no. And I was like, oh, what? I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, um, actually, that was a lie. I don't, I don't know what I was talking about there. <laughs> and, like, and I was like, oh, okay, never mind. Because then at that time, I had, so I had applied to all of these universities. And I genuinely thought, like, no one would accept me because I was such a, like, dropped out of this school then went to this school dropped out of that school went to this school went to farm school went to like, <laughs> look, at, like look at my thing and be like what's wrong with this chick like she doesn't need university she needs to just like sit down and chill out for a minute you know like and I was just like I was not expecting anyone to accept me and then mm. the day came that I was I was almost accepted to all the schools that I applied to <laughs> So then I was like, oh, look, I had this hardcore decision paralysis. And I was like, how the hell will I choose where yeah. to go? And I was like, okay, this is it. Another life crisis. I just won't go back to school. And oh, my no. mom, yeah, and that was like, I literally like do all the work to get into school, got into all the schools. And then I was like, I don't want any of them now. <laughs> so, like, it was so much like back and forth with my own brain with like, I feel uh, so lucky that I have such a supportive group of people around me and parents that like they put up with me having like constant oh my god Rhonda I went through this yeah. phase it, I call it my investigation phase mm -hmm. where I was like when I was trying to figure out if I should even go to university and like if yeah. things like that even matter I and this was like while I worked at a studio and st I would ask everybody like I think one of my downfalls but one of my like greatest strength is I literally can talk to everybody which yes. sometimes is, yeah, it's <laughs> super great sometimes yeah. it's super bad because I like talk to not good people and then sometimes I'll talk to all the amazing people you know <laughs> but everyone who like crosses by me I'm like that's someone I could be best friends with and I just want to <laughs> like know everything about them <laughs> and so I started this thing where I was like every single person that I like like older person that I respected yeah. I would like sit them down and be like, what was your life path? And like, Tell me what you did. And, like, I Which is so beautiful, but I'm laughing because I can just see you going, what was your life path? And they're like, I thought we were just like having lunch or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yep. I would literally be like, oh, you're here for a ceramic lesson. So as we're centering, what centered you? Like, how did you find your center in this universe? Oh, were you God. were you always interested in this? Like I was I like love it. <laughs> I am thankful that no one was like calling like whoever the psychiatry board was and be like, hey, this chick is like taking your job, but like not. Because I was I was trying to like figure out everything and it was it was yeah. through those like conversations through talking to all these people that I like really admired or even just like honestly random people that I yeah. just thought they had an interesting story and I, I realized like there's so much that can go on outside of academia that I was putting yeah. such a pressure on like this university degree and like this idea of like the school is like end all be all of yeah. everything that matters and I realized like it's just going to be a little segment of my life. And yeah. you know what? Make the most out of that segment and then moving on. Mm -hmm. And so where did would, that initial framework come from of like that the university was like this end all kind of mm, experience? Like where do you know where the roots of that are? Um, 
I would say definitely like I mean you know you're like when you're in high school and stuff like you're kind of like yeah you're doing all this to get to college yeah college was the thing and I come from immigrant parents who like college was everything for them and I love them to death but Mm -hmm. they're not but 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 they really pushed for education you know Mm -hmm. like and also I think something that probably a and maybe not only like children of the diasporas, but like, mm-hmm. like we have this insane guilt of like, well, at least I do. I need mm-hmm. to stop speaking generally, but mm-hmm. me personally, I have this feeling constantly like, oh my gosh, like, okay, I'm doing this, but is this like, is this what my parents came to America for me to do? Mm-hmm. Like, am I bringing respect upon them for doing this? Am I honoring their like pilgrimage here? Not pilgrimage, Mm. but their immigration here Mm -hmm. with doing like what I'm doing right now. And so Mm -hmm. I had, I constantly had this, like, not really like a, like it was a positive, you know, but sometimes very narrowing of my scope of life, but like this, this idea like you have to go to university like it's not an option to not go to university Mm -hmm. like at one point I had like again when I had the farming quarter life court crisis and Mm -hmm. then right after farming I finished that and I was like you know what actually like all these schools accepted me so maybe instead I should go to vocational school and be a carpenter because that was (laughs) like my next next thing (laughs) I wanted to do and then after carpentry I was like I saw people welding and I was like oh yeah I want to weld I want to be a deep sea underwater welder and like that was like an idea I had for a while until I started thinking about like what are they welding down there and then I was like (laughs) oh pipelines (laughs) yeah I don't want to do that that (laughs) goes against your sustainability (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) everything I stand for and I was like but I would get to work with the fishies (laughs) but but the fishies aren't hanging around industrial pipe side pipeline you know so so that Uh, died out too and and yeah but but again like always being you know like raised upon this I and I mean thinking about now like like I feel so hard for all the people who are just like just in high school now and they're about to go into college or even like even younger than that like Mm -hmm. I think we're getting to the point where it's like a college degree is now the bare minimum you know like you need to have it it's not like an option to not have it and so I I just always knew like I had to go to college and then I I never honestly thought I would like get to here you know like Mm. as someone who's been such a perpetual like like leapfrogger of things mm-hmm. like I, mm-hmm. I tend to do this thing where I fall in love with so many things so fast and I never mm-hmm. finish any of them I just go <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> like just dipping my toes in every little pool and then at the end I'm like why am I not wet you know mm. like what's going <laughs> why on am I not wet <laughs> yeah I love that <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's so much in that that's really useful like even in my own life I'm just like oh yeah I could use that as a mentality (laughs) I'm like I want to get wet I'm like I want to be submerged in water that is like life you know Mm, yeah I want to swim in it I want to be in like some sort of a riptide I want to get stuck in there like yeah there were so many things that I wanted and and I, I, I didn't, I didn't even think of Davis until I like came and visited and it was my mom who really pushed, like, you should really like go and see, cause I was never the type of kid when I was younger that even cared about college. Like yeah. I was very much so skipping classes. Like mm-hmm. I had the best art teacher ever that if you're out there and you hear this, Mr. Burnett, like I would definitely use your class as an excuse to skip mm-hmm. other classes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, oh, I, I'm going to go, I have to go paint a mural for Mr. Burnett. And <laughs> they would just let me go. Cause like, even though I was like a kid who always skipped class, I was always a well-behaved kid. I was always a straight A kid. So it was mm-hmm. like this weird mm-hmm. space of like, they're like, oh, well, she's one of the good ones. She's just a little like all over the place, you know? <laughs> so, I, but I was never one of the kids that like, you know, like did, like looked up what college I want to go to cared about Mm -hmm. colleges and so I had never done the thing that you're supposed to do in high school where you like think about the college spaces and yeah and think about where you're gonna go like I never did that and so I kind of had this moment as like a I came here when I was like 23 oh no 23 or 22 
and at 22 I was like visiting college campuses with my mommy <laughs> you know like and it was like woo let's go see this one she's like we're trying to get like pictures with the mascot so like everyone else is like a child <laughs> and I was like, like going to all the things all the like little college admission fairs and like everyone's a child and I was like oh my god this like big giant that's just like get out of here and like but then also like I wasn't you know like, yeah. it's like you have these moments when you're like you just you like I used to have such a like I'm still pretty self-conscious I think everyone should be self-conscious you know like mm-hmm. to be aware of yourself and how you are yeah. in the space but yeah. it was so bad when I was younger and honestly like it wasn't until ceramics that I began to get like a confidence in myself because I mm. was like like I'm great at this one thing and like Mm -hmm. this one thing is so important to me and Mm. because of that like it made everything else feel important like Mm. I would be you know like eating a meal turned into like oh my god like but what if I made the bowl you know yeah yeah everything started to just again like everything falls into place when Mm -hmm. you like least when you try the least you know yeah it's I was thinking in. about the phrase of like when you were describing it initially is like it's like a welcoming um like your spirit says you welcome what will come or mm-hmm. something like that and it's sort mm-hmm. of like when you put that out there and say like I like and you don't even have to say it, but I just think like I welcome what will come or I welcome the opportunities mm-hmm. then it does seem like just more it's so funny because it feels like more suddenly appear but the Mm -hmm. reality is they're probably there all the time and we just we weren't ready to be attuned to them yet we weren't Mm -hmm. ready to see them yet and Mm -hmm. and how do we more and like how do we with and I don't know if we need to always be that open in our lives or if that's Mm -hmm. something that we have to do like when you're talking about your quarter life crisis like Mm -hmm. maybe that's more like an opening like a quarter life Mm -hmm. opening like I need to Mm -hmm. open wide again to check mm-hmm. and receive what's around me to kind of find out where I go next. And then mm-hmm. maybe like when you have a path, then that's when we kind of like close a little bit so that we can keep move. So we start moving towards whatever that thing that came to us. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's like just coming to me as we're talking, but thinking about like, maybe those are just like moments of opening yes. for us. No, I think that's mm-hmm. a great, that's a much better thing to say than like my many quarter life crises. I'm going to It's say kinder it's to ourselves, right? Yeah. Like, yes. Yes. And that's something I have also been like starting to do too, is like Mm. kindness, like, especially like, you know, I'm, I don't want to be like the person on the podcast who brings up COVID, but like, (laughs) you can bring up COVID. (laughs) We need to talk. It's okay. It's dramatic. It's been a dramatic two years with that. (laughs) Yeah. And it's really made you like, you know, like, I'm like, oh man, like, why, why do we push ourselves to exhaustion? Like, I remember Mm. like, I mean, I pulled a couple all-nighters recently in my ripe mm-hmm. age of 26 now, but <laughs> before when I was like 18, 19, like all-nighters were like the common, I was mm. like, if I'm in bed before like 1 a.m., it was weird, you know? Mm. And I, yeah. and now I think about that and I'm like, oh my God, like that's why I was so exhausted yeah. every other time, you know? Yeah. And like yeah. not showing kindness, not showing like time for myself and that's something I've really been working on getting now. And I think once I graduate, like I'm so excited to like be on my own (laughs) time schedule. Like, yeah, that's going to be the most exciting. I mean, one of the many exciting things, but, um, I don't want to get too, I'm a very like scatterbrained. No, you're doing it. This is great. No, but what you just said makes me think I ask myself this one question with, um, kind of like on a repeat basis. And actually I was just realizing this week that I needed to ask myself it again. But the Mm -hmm. question is, what does my ideal day look like? Mm. And so I envision like, what is the right balance of the things that interest me? Um, Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what I think are the things I care about doing Mm -hmm. and things is not like physical things. It's more, it's more abstract, but just every now and then I take time to ask myself that. And then I try to write it out. Like my ideal day always starts with a cup of coffee. Yes, and always, always like it just does a mm-hmm. moment of that. And then it always mm-hmm. then moves from like, I like to wake up slow. And so it's like identifying what the things are, the qualities yes. of the day that bring mm-hmm. me the most 
fulfilling kind of experience. So like it has a bit of creativity and it. it has a bit of connection with others, whether it's through meetings or other things, but like mm-hmm. needing to take time every now and then to ask that because it recenters it for me. Cause okay. otherwise, you know, it's easy to be pulled from the yes. things that are outside of you without yes. intentional, it's that intentional living that you talked about yes. in the beginning too. Like what mm-hmm. is your intentional living going to look like? Mm-hmm. So, okay. Before we move into that kind of part, I want to ask you to about, um, cause you said that you knew when you were younger, that you wanted to be an artist, like that, that was an early driver. So mm-hmm. I'm, all, I'm also on the podcast, I've been asking people if they can recall an art object they made when they were young or art piece or an art experience, like something that has stayed with them that they remember doing when they were young. Do you have something oh like God. that? That yes. like stay? Okay, cool. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'd I love say- to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> the like the piece that anytime I think about like, like, whoa, I have like big ideas and big dreams coming up that I always think about it was it was in high school I made it, but I made this like it was about like eight feet tall, this like eight foot tall, terrifying sculpture thing. Uh-huh. And it was like the, this bust of a man that I had made out of plaster and like the um, like paper mache type style. Yeah. And then I got these like big long planks of wood from my dad because my dad used to be like a contractor. So I, I grown up around like construction and around mm-hmm. like like materials to build big things like that's what I've always been interested in and Mm -hmm. like I remember bringing these all into class because you know like I was it was um the universe or the the high school I went to didn't really have the most funding for Mm -hmm. its art department like one it's art department and then also it's in West Virginia so like Mm -hmm. (laughs) there were you know football fields definitely got a lot more attention than Mm -hmm. the art department so Mm -hmm. I brought in a lot of my stuff and it was like all these like so I basically I built this terrifying machine that was like (laughs) eight foot tall planky slender bust of a man thing that was also on wheels because I wanted it to be like portable and move around and yeah. menacing <laughs> and I had put a motor in it that was attached to the mouth of the man mm-hmm. and then a light bulb was inside and so when you turned it on the motor would open his mouth and go ah, 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 and there would be this <laughs> like this red light that would flash every now and then and then it was also on wheels and I would like turn it on and like chase everyone around with it and I was like this is amazing like this is so good and I realized like wow like art has the power to make people feel so many things I was like maybe I'm just terrifying people <laughs> like to me I thought I was building like something so I was like Michelangelo who like look at my guy and it was actually this like nightmare creature but I thought he was beautiful my dad still owns that thing it's oh I love it I know he still um, has it it's alone in the basement that has been unfinished since I was a freaking teenager yep and I, I want to go see it it's in West Virginia still oh, and I want to go see it and bring him home and send me like, a video <laughs> when you do go see it because I just yeah. want to see it too <laughs> so menacing and so I'm like what was wrong with me like, <laughs> it had these like like hollow eyes and then the mouth would just be like <laughs> rawr, 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 like really quick because I used like I think I used the motor of not like a drill but something similar like the speed yeah. of a drill so it yeah. was going it's really and then, fast <laughs> and the red light and then the wheels so he could move around and I would be behind him like <laughs> steering it around <laughs> It was so terrifying and my oh. my favorite piece still, you know, and that was that piece for sure. And oh. um, yeah, I, I, it's funny, like, because now I feel like I, I still love to make work that is very, um, I think, not like in your face, but like very <laughs> much so demands attention sometimes. Yeah, I was because as you were describing, I was thinking about that, too, as a follow up is like, how does that interest that piece that you made carry through into the work that you even like put together for this show that's opening Mm -hmm. tonight like Mm -hmm. so and you said art can make people feel things like lots of things too so Mm -hmm. are you still is that still a driving force in the work that you've created lately do you want to talk a bit about like what you've been making and what's going to be in that show tonight yes yes I would love to talk about that so there I mean 
the piece that I'm thinking of right now that is I'm really hoping I get people to feel things and open up <laughs> and you know talk mm-hmm. to themselves but yeah you know outwardly is I I've built I've been getting really into like space and occupying spaces and how our environment can like send us back to certain memories and Mm. um I have this piece in the show that is it's an interactive piece which is something I've been like really into and I love any artwork that gets people to like be a part of it is like Mm. the best for me like I love watching that happen and I love seeing how people interact with the objects how they like step away and they like they they tell me like hey like that really gave me a chance to like reflect on things that I hadn't reflected on Mm. before and like that's what I want to make and Mm. those are the spaces I want to make for people and so Mm -hmm. so this piece there's a couple big pieces in this show but the the piece that I'm really really excited about and it's like new I did it all just for the show is I've created like almost a living room in the gallery and mm-hmm. um, kind of a living room that uh, aesthetically ties back to like the living room of my grandparent, my father's parents um, mm-hmm. in Iran. And mm-hmm. so I have this like cushiony comforter on the floor with pillows and this like old butter pail in the middle that I'm inviting mm-hmm. people to like sit down at the space, allow themselves to like write either a secret, a thought, a feeling, Mm. a guilt, a worry, anything, and um, put it into my pail. And then in the living room space is this like, almost like a altar, but not so much an altar, but um, that will have, it's a TV I made, which is just a wooden (laughs) box with two wires sticking out of the top. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's like the symbol of a TV. It's perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, well, I'm going to put my iPad in it to play a video to, because mm-hmm. I, like, I wanted to play a video, but they were like, hey, dude, like, burn it onto a DVD. And I was like, what the hell is that? So then who I does decided, that anymore? Yeah. So I was put like, it on a USB or like yeah, cloud. I, I like, don't know. <laughs> can't do that. Can't do that. So instead, I went like super analog and I was like, caveman build TV. <laughs> <laughs> So I instead built the TV and it's just this like wood box that I'm going to put my iPad in and play the video that way, like super lo-fi, but super yeah. future at the same yeah. time. Yeah. And, and it's just, I, the video has, it's a, a lot to do with um, like a, a subject that I think is like a Iranian American and also like was raised Muslim, still like thinking about am I still part of that is that something I want to continue exploring like the video Mm -hmm. kind of has to do with that and Mm. a lot of my work has to do with like the diaspora Iranian diaspora Middle Mm -hmm. Eastern diaspora and Mm -hmm. um so in this piece like so then I'm once everyone has given me willingly I'm not going to force anyone to do anything and anonymously uh, given me these papers I'm taking them all to a like a secluded secret location that is like (laughs) my place for it I call it one of my contemplation stations mm. and so I, oh I love I, it yeah I have a lot of contemplation stations are so important I require I think everyone should have at least like five you know and one of them should also be like a actual table that like or any space that when something calls to you like I will put it in my contemplation station mm. and it's something that I know I can go back to and then there are actual contemplation station spaces like And so one of the ones that I will go to, I want to keep it a secret. Yeah. Kind of protect it. Yes. And like the idea, I've been thinking a lot about um, like secrecy in terms of multi-generational secrets, in terms Mm. of self-preservation, like in this day and age, like where almost everything about everyone is available to anyone. Like what are the things that we still hold sacred? You know, like Mm. what are the things that, we feel that is not something everyone should know or something we're too afraid to let anyone know. And so I've let been me, thinking a lot about those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you use, you use the word sacred, right? Yes. So something just this week in another podcast I was listening to is on um, actually we can do hard things with Glenn and Doyle and they had mm. Liz Gilbert as a guest, but they were talking about, no, it was on, it was on a special event. It wasn't on the episode, but mm. they were talking about sacredness and mm-hmm. whether sacredness is private or is there something sacred about sharing wisdom 
And that that's part of like sacredness too, is passing on wisdom from one person to the next. And it, and then that else, yeah. But it just, I wanted to point that out because I think it's interesting, like to think about that secrecy and sacredness, like what's Mm -hmm. the connection between them or what's the disconnect or like, are they connected? Are they inextricably connected or different from one another? Mm -hmm. Um, But wondering about that in there. Mm, Okay. Yeah, yeah. no, go ahead. (laughs) I think definitely like there's, I mean, I think that they both can exist on their own, right? Like Mm -hmm. not every secret is sacred and not everything sacred is secret, but Mm. there is also that space that like, there are super sacred secrets. Like there are things that I know about my family that I wouldn't want other people to know. Mm -hmm. There are things I know about them that I want everybody to know, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so kind of thinking about that space and thinking about like, I don't know like it's this like like social desire to be seen but then not seen and I've been Mm. thinking a lot about like how am I perceived how is my gaze like Mm. how do I make people feel when I'm observing them and Mm. so I've been thinking a lot about that and and going back to going back to the um piece tonight is I'm going to and and I'm realizing like as I'm making these works like Mm-hmm. as artists like we really put ourselves in like these vulnerable positions sometimes yeah. for work and thinking about is is it fair to myself to do mm-hmm. this to myself mm-hmm. and, like is my desire to make this piece greater than like my desire for like my mental health you know like, yeah like what risk are you putting yourself in by making mm-hmm. this this experience happen in the way that it's going to happen for other exactly. for others yeah yes exactly yeah. and and then also thinking like wow like am I, am I taking too much too? And I think a lot about Mm. like, is the stuff I'm taking from people, is it reciprocated in their experience? Like, Mm. do they feel that they're getting something out of it as well? And and I really hope that this piece will help people in the ways that this practice has kind of helped me Mm because for the longest time I've had this practice of like, when something is troubling to me, when I have feelings or unsaid words and, you know, things that I, I, I struggle with like getting out into the world Mm -hmm. I find that like writing them down and burning them has been the most cleansing thing ever and Mm -hmm. there's something about fire that like is so I mean not to be like cliche but it's so regenerative and it's Mm -hmm. so like I think often about like the phoenix and how the phoenix like rose up from the ashes yeah it's like a huge like folklore and or um mythological character in like Iranian Mm -hmm. culture and Mm -hmm. in all types of culture and then Mm -hmm. thinking about like like a lot of indigenous practices that like the way that they like brought nutrient and Mm -hmm. like brought strength back to their soil was to do like slash and burn and thinking about how fire plays its part in like the regeneration of this like depleted soil and Mm -hmm. oftentimes like that's what I feel I feel like a depleted soil Mm -hmm. you know like sometimes Mm -hmm. it's like the last crop that got pulled out of me took it all out of me and yeah and now I need that regeneration and so I'm gonna be taking these secret these slips of like I'm welcoming people to write anything and everything that they want it can be with their name or it could be anonymous Mm -hmm. it all depends on them and then taking these and taking them to one of my contemplation stations and then kind of reading them out loud just to Mm. nobody like Mm. I would be the only one to read them and then burning them and Mm. I think I'm going to do like a I don't know I've been playing a lot with like how do we make these moments accessible for everyone to see because it's Mm -hmm. I felt strange in this moment that I was realizing like I was asking people to share these intimate things with me Mm -hmm. and then I'm taking them away from them and then Mm. experiencing them on my own in a sense of I'm helping them though to get rid of it you know what I think you might be doing though too in this is you're bearing witness to whatever Mm. it is that they share with you And Mm -hmm. you just a moment ago had said, you know, how much do you want to be seen or something to that effect, talking about wanting to be seen, but not seen. And, Mm -hmm. and like you reading their words aloud is bearing witness and seeing them for that Mm -hmm. moment of thing they shared. And I, you know, I I think there's a lot of talk about this elsewhere, but I don't have sources, but the idea Mm -hmm. of like, as humans, we want to be seen by other humans. It's part of like, 
validating or like, I, sure, you know, you and I were talking before, like we had this tornado this week and like my parents mm-hmm. came the next day just cause they were coming. Mm-hmm. And I think there was part of what I needed them to be here to bear witness to it too, to be like, mm-hmm. yeah, something happened. And like, Mm -hmm. that's what you're doing for these people with whatever slips of paper. And then you're speaking it aloud, whether they're there or not, the Mm -hmm. act of what you're promising to do is to bear witness to something for them. Mm. Wanda, that is beautiful. (laughs) And that's, wow. That's, I love that so much. Cause I was trying to figure out like, cause I I just could tell it was something I needed to do. And I was, but Mm -hmm. like, I was kept telling myself like, but why, like, why am I giving myself this like at first I thought like it's giving me this like sense of ownership over their secrets but then Mm. I realized like I think the way that I'm looking at it that I didn't think about was like I'm simply just acting as like a vehicle to help them you know and yeah I think that's something that I I really love to do with my art practice and Mm. I had this great art piece that um she's dead now she was murdered but I had like mm. the astroturf Tonda Civic that yeah I would, yeah so at I first would. we said she's murdered I was like oh my god she said that word so casually <laughs> no she was she was just you know physically it was a car the car yeah. was murdered I used the word murdered because I love to personify inanimate objects all the time mm-hmm. but uh it was this this vehicle that I made that I realized like I think it helped other people more than it helped me and the making like I had people that would like if I would like go out anywhere I would come out and people are like on top of it having photo shoots they just think Mm -hmm. it's the most fun thing and it Mm -hmm. was also I created this piece like during the like the height of quarantine so Mm. it was like you know like the places you would go that you would see other human beings and maybe get a moment of like organic real laughter would be like the grocery store yeah. the post office and those are places that I would leave my car and I would just like sit back and observe and see like what happens and mm-hmm. like I'm talking like the whole thing was astroturf so people would be like on the hood they would be on the top sometimes I'd get a little bit worried because it was like a 1998 Honda Civic so like I was like okay let's be a little bit careful maybe not like four people on the ceiling like I still have to drive this like this is my car (laughs) so there were moments that I would step in and be like ah hold up hold up hold up a little too far a little too far like let's just tone it back a bit but other than those moments and I, I realized like like I had so many, like I would be driving down the highway and like people are like taking pictures and laughing. And like mm-hmm. there were these moments that I felt like, oh man, like that just feels so beautiful to see like another human laugh in the first yeah. time in so long, you know, mm-hmm. and not like a, a on the Zoom or like on yeah. a movie that for a while, like we were all just stuck in this like little rectangle world, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah. And they're just so like things like that. I I just, I don't know. I, I really love making work like that. And um, yeah, and going back to uh, the living room piece tonight is mm-hmm. I'm, I'm hoping to, I don't know. I, I want to um, just create a space that people will feel comfortable and they'll feel safe to unload these things that maybe they have not had prior space and Mm -hmm. ability to unload and I'm going to be completely judgment free and Mm -hmm. I have this idea of live streaming it so that people can see that it's happening but I'm going to mute it so that no one can hear the secrets Mm -hmm. and so and yeah that's so so powerful because I was thinking about all the things that that can like layer on and bring up more questions and other yeah oh that's beautiful oh thank you yeah can't wait to know when you're going to do that when you're going to yes, live stream I will it. definitely let yeah I will let everybody know and it will be it will be a fun time and and yeah. I don't know like there's a lot of pieces in the show that um yeah my work is kind of it's funny like we're again going back to talking about the quarter system and art making like yeah. one thing that I think has been great with this is because you have to work so so fast I don't get the ability which sometimes is great sometimes it sucks Mm -hmm. but I don't really get the ability to like really like ruminate in an idea Mm. and I and I like my the things that I was interested in have like exponentially grown since like Mm -hmm. I first came here and 
like when I first came here I was just making like a lot of like weird things like still in my like found object making it creepy type of deal mm-hmm. which I was mm-hmm. like eh, you know <laughs> like, I think I want to grow up from this a little and mm. and now I've kind of and then I went into my like only making like work that's written in Farsi and I'm like I only want Iranians to know what I'm making like screw mm-hmm. everybody else and then mm-hmm. I was like oh wait I love everybody so then I was just like <laughs> I don't want that either and but I still want you know to make yeah. work that is like for people that I feel like you know like Iranians we've had like such a history and like in mm-hmm. art but then you don't see much of a you know a big representation in contemporary art and yeah so still wanting to represent that culture but then thinking about more so like in a broader space of loss of feelings of you know displacement of relocation feelings of um I don't know like oftentimes I find myself feeling like I'm occupying spaces I'm not supposed to be in and then yeah. why do I feel that you know yeah like, what makes me think that mm-hmm. so- what what have you learned about that in asking yourself that question of what makes you feel that what makes you feel like you you're in a space you you shouldn't be Mm. honestly I think it's it's a lot of it has to do with like my own my own ideas of who I am you know Mm -hmm. like I Mm -hmm. think like oh well because I'm not a my dog was jumping off and I didn't want her to take all my cords down with her. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I feel like, I don't know, a lot of it has to do with, I think, if I really, really go back and I try to think of like, where did this like feeling of, you know, my own self-imposed uh, prisoning happen? Mm-hmm. And it, I think, has to do with like, growing up in a place that like I didn't really feel like I was supposed to be there all the time like I constantly felt like like dude like my parents like are the first in our ancestry line to like move to West Virginia like (laughs) we're not supposed to be here you know (laughs) I'm like I need to be in a desert like where are my dunes you know like I'm not supposed to be in this like temperate little woodland area (laughs) like it was all these things that I started to to just like really think about like am I I would and then I would put this pressure on myself like well if I'm occupying this space like am I making it better am I yeah is it like how can I make this space like work more for everybody else and like I realized like mm-hmm. you're allowed to just simply exist like, you recently, are yeah I recently figured that out like you can just exist and be alive and that's okay and and I think I don't know I just I think also as like as women a lot of time like we're constantly told like to you know step back let your Mm -hmm. you know usually men take the lead on things you have to Mm -hmm. step back and like not really be heard not really be like a voice that is taken seriously and so Mm. I think it was again like going back to ceramics like when I started finding my confidence in ceramics like I started finding my confidence in the world and I was like Mm. hey man like you can't talk to me like don't disrespect me like that don't talk over me like Mm -hmm. I've I've gotten to the point now like if I'm being interrupted I will like stop the interruption and be like hey no actually I was speaking and Mm -hmm. I never ever would have thought I would be that person and Mm -hmm. I think that that's just like (laughs) you learn as you like go on and on and on as like an artist and just like a like a young woman also in Mm -hmm. this world like you just have to sorry I'm gonna lay down you can do whatever you need to (laughs) (laughs) I was like crouching like a little goblin and my back was starting to hurt (laughs) and um yeah and just like like there's just I don't know and I think like again with the pandemic like it made me realize like the things that we have for so long held so sacred like why you know like Mm -hmm. why do why have we put this like idea of like this is how we should you know be in the outside world like Mm -hmm. you have to be you you know like I I used to be the type of person that like unless I was like I was looking good and I was like in good clean clothes like I was like oh my gosh like I don't want people to know I'm like making art like they're gonna think I'm gross if they see me at the you know I don't want to be like a nuisance at the grocery store with like clay dust trailing me 
And now it's like, <laughs> now it's like, <laughs> I like, I will openly go to anything I need to do. And I'm in like totally my work clothes and I'm like occupying as much space that I think I want to occupy. Yep. Of course, without being rude. Like, right. I still do believe you're just existing, like, just existing something that I never really like let myself do before. And mm. I don't know. It's been like a really, it's been really interesting. It's been really fun to see like, how does my personality change? How do my art pieces change? Um, mm. Have you, I'm curious, I'm just, as you're talking, I'm thinking like, have you gotten to a place where you feel like your art just gets to exist too without um validation like I'm not yes. sure if I'm asking quite the right question but it's like the no. idea that you as a human get to just exist like that yeah mm -hmm. you get to, you get to just be out and exist like I I think for some people it might be they might need to apply that phrase to their art too like you mm -hmm. know what our art can just exist yes without any anything else like other yeah. than just to be made without, and like, like, having to be like in a class or without like being you know like in a show like you can just make work to just make work and that's mm -hmm. something like I also like struggled with for a while and I was like mm. you know like we're always our worst critics you know our mm -hmm. own worst critics and I would always think like oh man like this piece is good but I don't know like will other people get it well like mm -hmm. is it like showing is, what does it mean to them or Mm -hmm. oh man like what if it doesn't get into the show that I'm like I'm making the piece for the show mm -hmm. and now I you know I still sometimes will like make if I think a show is interesting I'll like I will work on a piece that I think can fit into it but then yeah. at the end of the day if it doesn't then it simply doesn't and mm -hmm. I think there's like a beauty in just simply just letting ourselves create and I think it also really helps in an art practice also to just yeah constantly just create things like I have a practice of just when I feel that I'm in a block or something one of the things I love to do is just mindlessly collage like mm. no like no idea of what the heck I'm doing I just like go through there used to be I'm running out of them now because I've been using them all up but there was this like <laughs> old abandoned like if UC Davis if you're listening don't come for me but there was like <laughs> <laughs> like this <laughs> definitely like they know I was in there because now it's all boarded up with like bigger screws and like I don't have the tools to get in it anymore but there's this like abandoned building on like the southern part of campus that I was obsessed with like at the mm. start of the pandemic when there's like nobody out on the road to catch me doing my little <laughs> raccoony business I'm very much so existing in the world like a raccoon at that time because I was like look at all these things I can get into <laughs> and I, was like, I would go into this place and it was amazing Rhonda like it was this old lab that they had like totally abandoned and there was like floor to ceiling like bookshelves full of like old old Nat Geo magazines and I remember going I know the best amazing. kind for collage mm -hmm. they yes. are <laughs> so many of them and I went in there one day like I had two milk crates and I just started taking them all in and then I was like fuck it and I like oh. and then I just put it <laughs> and I just started putting it more and more and more into my like car and then I had so many and then I was like okay I'm being selfish and then I gave away a bunch of them <laughs> and then I went back and then I like <laughs> took all the other things and I like got all these like weird science instruments like and I just started making work with all these random things I was finding at this place but mm. now I think they've caught on I went back recently and there's like these big big bolts on the doors and I'm like oh, oh. yeah and I'm just trying to make art but it was just I, it was just sitting here unused. it was just sitting here like no one's you <laughs> like it literally was like just molding away and like oh. they were gonna demolish it and I was like hey man this is so much yeah stuff. Like, this could be used yeah and so uh. I was but but through that I got all those Nat Geos and stuff and like yep started doing all this like collaging and then I recently I was in like a seminar with um Anne Hamilton and my friend <gasps> Marcel oh I, may oh my god she's so inspiring to she's listen to so inspiring and so amazing and it was like it was about like a week to two week long seminar and like they gave us all of this like amazing reading to do which I'm still like 
going through and I'm yeah. like printing all of them and like reading them on any free time that I have. And yeah, they took us to all of these spaces on the campus that like an art student usually wouldn't go, right? Like they took us to uh, the herbarium and we saw all of these beautiful, like amazing species of plants and like the way that they classify them and looking at the seeds like up close and then like finding out like, oh my God, now I want to just work with seeds because they're yeah. so magical. And yeah, it was really beautiful also because something I've been noticing again, tying into the like, when you let go and just kind of let the universe like do all, not all the work, but you know, a breath of the work, mm -hmm. like everything starts mm -hmm. to make sense. Like I did not think that like agriculture and art would ever mesh together and then I ended up going here to Davis and mm -hmm. like when I first moved here like I started working on the farm all the time and I found a lot of stuff that I wanted to do had to do with things that I would learn at the farm like I started getting into like wedging seeds into clay and then making those like germinate mm. and sprout mm. and I had these like living art pieces and then during the seminar like they took us to the herbarium they took us to this amazing greenhouse on campus that has like every climate of the world that exists they have the plants that live there they have corpse flowers which I like never thought I would ever see they and are not were they blooming, blooming? they're no, not blooming they're though because like they no. bloom very rarely right is mm -hmm, that the deal because mm -hmm. I think we had one on the campus that I worked at because it also had an agricultural school and so mm -hmm. I remember like whenever it blooms and just bloomed this year like they always share about it because it's mm -hmm. like such a deal and it's like a big event yeah and, like, like they took us to that they took us to like where the dairy cattle and the meat cattle are like kept and I'm also vegan and then that made me start thinking about like oh my god like there's this like this whole like animal activism side of like my mm -hmm. life that I mm -hmm. never really make work about. And then mm -hmm. I started thinking about like, wow, what are the things that I can do now that I know that I can be in this space? And mm -hmm. they took us to like the swine lab. It was just like, there was so yeah. much, it was an amazing, amazing seminar. And I'm so eternally grateful for it. So why and, tell me about, cause I know about Anne Hamilton's work and it was Michael, what was his last Michael name? Marcel. Marcel. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm, I don't think I'm familiar. So tell me about what he does and like, what was the focus of the seminar then that would bring them to bring you to all these spaces? Mm -hmm. So I think the, so they're actually, they're, uh, they are husband and wife, I believe oh. or partners. They, they're partners. Okay. Like, I don't know about the husband and wife, but I know they're partners in life art partners and also life. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, his work is like a lot of photography, a lot of, he made this documentary about uh, our connection to like livestock animals and mm. things like that. And our connection to the agrarian world. And mm -hmm. so the seminar altogether was, I would say about, really like opening up our eyes to how our like food system works, how agriculture works in terms of not just like bringing us food also, but also what is the benefits of, you know, like helping farm animals? What are the mm -hmm. benefits of how do we communicate with the agrarian world and things mm -hmm. like that? And mm -hmm. it was just this. And so mm -hmm. they, they took us to all of these spaces that, like I said before, like, an art student would normally never see you know yeah and then making us think about the things that go on there like what are the ethics of like animal husbandry and mm -hmm. how do we like why do we always I constantly think about this of like why do humans think of themselves as like the protagonists of the world you know like, yeah why are we always the ones that everything is all about do we ever like mm -hmm. you know like have people mm -hmm. ever like stepped back and like oh I will never like while I was at the at the Anderson Ranch, which is where Rhonda and I met, like mm -hmm. I will never forget standing at like Mount Sopress in Carbondale and just looking at this giant mountain. Oh yeah, and being like, whoa! <laughs> like <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I feel like a visit to the mountain. I always tell people I love going to the mountains because I love feeling so small. I yes. love feeling so insignificant in mm -hmm. my physicality and in mm -hmm. the breath of life like it's just like it's yeah it does that it's for me every insane. time yeah every time like no matter how many mountains I will ever see no matter even like going to the ocean and like yeah uh, 
like you just the magic that is this world that we are on is Mm -hmm. so insanely like no human can ever like grasp you know like yeah there will never be enough words enough art pieces enough anything that I can make that will like be as magical and amazing as this earth itself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. I don't know just thinking about like like we are not the protagonist like this earth is the protagonist Mm -hmm. and we need to realize Mm -hmm. that and just start like working as many ways as possible on like how to help her and Mm -hmm. like it just it makes me yeah uh, that's the, like no. environmentally farmer in me that's like we need to fight for her get it well and it requires like what you're describing too i think is like decentralizing the human ego <laughs> like yes. like you're decentralizing like it's like the human ego is centered so often and that's why mm-hmm. humans are the protagonists because that's that's where we sit and so it takes such it require it will require collective work mm-hmm. to like bring the earth as the the protagonist and the part mm-hmm. that needs to be like at the center of how we which yes. is ironic because it is at the center of how like, we yeah. live on the outside of it like, mm-hmm. yeah, humans live all around outside. it yeah we're the adornments like we are just the accessory is like we are not the like the, we're not the dress you know we're like the necklaces and mm-hmm. like it's just like we're like the the gloves the cool gloves yeah and, like, each human is a bead Mm, yep each human's a bead someone's Mm -hmm. the string um yeah it's just like I don't know so um forget where I was going with this well it kind of pulls me into like our like where like where you see yourself moving though with your work and your ideas Mm -hmm. after graduation here like you'll have this you know experience of your show and like these sort of ceremonial things that mark an end and then you're then you're moving into a new beginning and it's and so I'm wondering, like, can you tell us what those, what are those, what is it looking like for you next? What is, what are you going to do that you already know? What are the unknowns? What are the curious, mm. the question, what are the questions you're asking yourself moving forward mm. that, in those things too? Oh my gosh. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I know there's a lot of unknown, which I kind of like, like mm-hmm. before I used to stress out so hard about what's the unknown mm-hmm. and And now I think that it's kind of welcoming because it's like in those spaces that I'm not even sure like what I, because also I've been so accustomed to like, okay, this quarter ended, get ready for next quarter. Like like, you're so, the pace, the like the assurance that like after something is done, there is already something else waiting to be done, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. so I'm excited to just kind of see like, how will the fluidity of like, all the millions of things that I'm so passionate and interested about like how did they Mm -hmm. all dwell into each other and I know right after graduation I'm um I I have a couple plans for like the summer I got into like a residency in Vermont Mm -hmm. and so I'll be in that and then I got um a scholarship to go back to the ranch but this time as a student intern. I know it's so fun to be a student there you're gonna love (laughs) oh my god I'm so excited (laughs) but I'm also gonna look at the interns and be like I understand I so feel like, you. Yeah. I feel you, brother. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was you once. <laughs> like, it's so it, like, yes. Like, it'll be, I think it'll be so much fun. What are you going to, what's the workshop that you're going to take or get to take? So it's, I cannot pronounce the artist's name, so I will not butcher it, mm-hmm. but it is a sculpture and performance based sculpture class. What a perfect class for you. I know. I'm oh, so exciting. excited. I'm that's so excited. I know their first name is Anne, and then like we could look it up. We could look it up, and I could write it down. I could write it in the show notes, as they say, and I could just say, "This is who she's going to study with." Perfect, perfect. Because I do not want to disrespect them by like mispronouncing their name hardcore. Yeah, and um, so I'm excited for that. And then when I get back, um, I have a pretty nice job here in Davis that I'm gonna stay at for a while. Mm -hmm. for about a year I think um Mm -hmm. maybe more um but I want to just I want to move to Sacramento maybe you know the big sack yeah (laughs) I was just there for the first time this year (laughs) so you know the big city yeah because you live in 
describe where you live. You call it, you call each other domies <laughs> yeah. where you live, but yeah. really quick, describe for people where you've lived during your time. This is so great. <laughs> <laughs> so during my time in Davis, I have lived in literally the most amazing place ever. It is the, uh, the domes co-op and, mm-hmm. um, it's amazing. There's about 15 domes. Each dome has, there's three that are like under construction. So there's no one living in them, Mm -hmm. but, um, each dome has like two people in it. I have an amazing roommate right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's amazing where it's a, this great little community of like-minded, like fun kids who just love the earth, love art, love (laughs) music. There's shows here. There's this like we have potlucks, we have meetings, they do a lot, we do a lot of work on the property, and Mm -hmm. it's this, like, um, I don't know, it's just beautiful, I I never thought I would be, like, someone who lives in a co-op, you know, and it's part, it's part of the university, yeah, 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 that's, that's the other part that kind of always blows my mind, mm -hmm. it's part of the university where you get to live, yeah, yep, it's on campus, it's an on-campus, um, of like a campus affiliated co-op that is it's literally domes like it's literally like the best way I can describe it is like a iceless igloo is what mm-hmm. they look like like mm-hmm. everyone who sees them either calls them the domes or the igloos mm-hmm. and so there are these like beautiful and it's also amazing because my dogs lives here and yeah. she is like pretty much has been appointed like the domes mascot like Aww. there'll be events and like last night it was great like I there was an event but I was setting up for my show so I couldn't uh, join the event but I think my housemate took Saya Saya is my dog took mm-hmm. Saya out for um the event and like I got to see like vicariously live through her by like the end of the night everyone had like posted her on their Instagram and I was like <laughs> that's my girl <laughs> like, it was so cute and like it's just such a like a beautiful community here and yeah just it's so much fun like every, every dome looks different because in 1972 that's when they were actually built by like students mm-hmm. just everyday Joe Schmo students not like specifically construction students so like <laughs> a lot of things are a little bit not up to code so <laughs> that's like the magic of living in it though like I definitely have just like open wiring everywhere like <laughs> If I plug in, <laughs> you plug in like too many things in the kitchen, like the living room goes out. So <laughs> like, but those are like things that are like so fun about living here. And I'm, I'm definitely, I, I think one of the, the main things I will be sad about moving on from is like no longer living in this space. I am, however, looking forward to having like walls again. There's yeah. something about like, <laughs> like not living in a place with walls that I'm like, where do I hang things? Yeah. And, like, you know, and especially it's, when it's, you're an art person who probably has yes. your own art, other art, mm-hmm. and then it is like, where do you put it? Where, where what do I put them? Do? Yeah, so you'll so have. Right. When do you have to? Do you have to move out of there right away too? When you leave? No, they're or not being for living. really. Yeah, oh, awesome. they're being really, really kind and like amazing. Like I have have been talking to um the gentleman who like kind of he's not like our manager, but he's like the head co-op guy. Sure, you know. And he, I, it was so casual. I was just like, oh, hey, like realized I need a place to live. I was originally going to move out in June, mm-hmm. but then I found out the place I work at, I can't take off July as well since I'm okay. already taking off like basically the whole summer and I yeah. just got hired there. And yeah, I was literally <laughs> like, they were like, yeah, so I think we want you on board. And I was like, okay, great. But I'm going to be gone for like, blah, 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 blah. And they were like oh, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I'm starting to realize that's a theme now that I just also talked about that other place. That <laughs> that's was right. Like, you oh, did. Tired. And I was like, oh, wait, actually, I'm leaving. <laughs> like, so I'm starting to find out that that's a little theme in my life. I, guess I need to think about it. I think that. it's more and more common, though, that when people do get interviewed or hired that they say like, well, I have these commitments, though, first. Like, I think that yeah. that's, that's to, becoming like, a little more normalized. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's, like, another thing that I'm so glad that we're, like, 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 the place that I work at now, they mm-hmm. are so, like, aware that I, like, they, they specifically told me, like, we want to make this, like, an amazing job for, like, an, a working artist, like, mm, they're cool. paying me a wage that is fair, and then with the scheduling, like, I'll be able to, like, have like my own studio practice and so that's 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 one of my next big steps yes I'm so grateful and they're it's like an amazing team of just like strong amazing women which I Mm -hmm. love just like working with strong amazing women all the time Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. the more like badass estrogen I can get around in my life like that's (laughs) what I want you know (laughs) 
and it just I'm excited and so what kind I of work will you be doing so I'm like the I'm the ceramics um like I'm the official title is teaching artist but mm -hmm. I'm basically also the ceramics like manager like oh cool like studio ceramic. manager kind of thing mm -hmm. cool like it's just the studio and it's like me and I think they're probably gonna hire one more person okay and we're just we'll just be the ceramic people and we teach ceramics, we go talk ceramics, do ceramics, go home, make more ceramics. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And oh, so then it's fair to say one of the things you're really hopeful for is to be able to have an active art making practice in yes. the future. And then do you do you always intend to have a job as well that support that allows for that? Or do you like tell me more about what you want to do? Like what else you're hoping for to yeah. do? Um so I think, I don't know. I think, I mean, I would love for one day to not have to have like an other job, you know, and yeah. maybe just make money off of like selling work or something else like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm thankful that also my work is very close to what I want to do anyways. Yeah. So um, yeah, I I think in the future, I would like, I do have a really big, big dream in the future. Yeah, like in the next do you want to share anything? Oh and share what? Yes, yes, I can totally share because it's literally all I've been talking about and it's all I think about like every five seconds. I'm like, oh, well, I can't wait for like in a year. Like I have this plan that in it, after like a year of just like living and working and like, you know, getting in the gist of like, I'm out of school and everything. Mm -hmm. I really, really think that like, spiritually mentally physically everything that is the mm -hmm. embodiment of my existence literally I'm being dramatic in it I know but this is how my brain works but like I cannot go on until I like go and live in Iran for like six oh, months like yeah. I have to go back there yeah there's just like every time I read about a new artist and I mm -hmm. or I, I watch I've been really getting into like Iranian art house films, which I never even knew existed. Yeah, and I'm going to like write that down. Yes. OK, you should definitely look up the movie The Cow. It OK, like blew my mind is probably my favorite movie now. Awesome. And I I just want to I think I have this big idea of to just kind of it probably won't be so much clay based unless it's my like I have this like more of an ephemeral clay practice that yeah. I will make things but then kind of just let them disintegrate and go back to like being part of the earth again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but really like I, I just like I don't know I don't know if it's like something like you know like as a diaspora kid like do we all go through this moment where we're like mm. we must return to the homeland like mm. it's like this like un like I cannot make it shut up in me yeah you know? like yeah you like need every single thing I'm like I need to be back there I need mm -hmm. to go back and and I'm totally aware it's going to be really difficult like of course like I don't know like if um you know like the the government of Iran and I don't want to say too many things about it but right it's um it'll be a little it'll be complicated to do it but you can yeah. do it yeah but I can do it and I want to just kind of I want to spend time just living with different people and mm -hmm. just kind of traveling through the entire country and just documenting and learning and like there are some like ancient Iranian handicrafts that I feel like as someone who's like a creative person yeah. from this heritage I'm like it's like my my duty like yeah. this is my like like calling I need to learn these things yeah and so I want to learn under these like great masters and I want to like fix my not fix but I want to practice my Farsi more I want mm -hmm. to like really be deeply deeply enmeshed into my true culture you know mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. because I think not only will it is it something I need like as a person, but like as an, as my art practice, like I find myself mm -hmm. like every time I make anything that is about Iran and anything that's about like where I came from, like it has this like void in it that yeah. is, you know, I, does it feel like, like an observer more than a, yes. yeah. Than a, than a lived, lived you know? experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels more so I'm, I'm observing what I should be living, mm -hmm. you know, and it's mm -hmm. such a strange feeling that mm -hmm. just like, like I'm tired of just like reading books or watching movies to feel closer, you know, like I mm -hmm. need to be there. And mm -hmm. so that's one of my big, big dreams and hopes for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I also have this like big pipe dream. I have missed camping. I used to go camping like every weekend when I was mm -hmm. like a flouncy little like 
I work sometimes and also go to community college. Like you have so much more time. And yeah, so you do. <laughs> and so much more time. It was insane. And I would always go camping. And that's something mm-hmm. that I think was like really important to my core values because mm-hmm. it's like there's something about like stripping away all of the extra things in mm-hmm. our lives. Like yeah. and just being there, especially in the desert. I would specifically always be in Anza Borrego down in Southern California. Mm-hmm. And there's just something about being out there that just like it makes my brain shut up it makes Mm -hmm. my body calm down like Mm -hmm. I'll bring usually like one to two books and that's all I let myself do is like set Mm -hmm. up my hammock read Mm -hmm. my book you know sometimes Mm -hmm. Saya and I will go for like a little adventure walk we'll Mm -hmm. go like spelunking do our little (laughs) like you know jumping on boulders and be like oh dinner time and then like, <laughs> have our little meal and then read more and mm. it was just a time that I felt like I was really in tune with like my intentional lifestyle that I'm yeah. really interested in and in tune with like what's important to me and what I care about and mm. so I want to do more of that and I want to I want to allow myself to like slow down like as much as I love yeah. like being a heart like I I know it sounds like really weird and probably like Henry Ford is like like yeah in his grave somewhere right now but like I like love being a hard worker <laughs> like <laughs> there's something like wrong with me that I'm like if I'm not like constantly struggling and like dying to get mm. things done you know mm-hmm. like what's the point you know there's just something about like do you yeah get, do you get there's it? Like, well there's a lot of conversation I feel like this is a new trend in conversations about why do we have a belief that work must be hard mm, yes Mm -hmm. And, and like, what if work was based on being easy, like that Mm -hmm. it can, that work can happen with ease instead of work happening with struggle or with like lots of, lots of time or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like there, I feel like I'm hearing more people talk about that as a general thing too. So hearing you articulate it as well is just, and like, (laughs) what if reading your book is your work? Exactly. Like in that moment, that's your mm-hmm. work. That's your yeah. work. And like, like we are so like, so ingrained in our mind that like, like, you know, the whole idea of like, oh, well, you have to get the nine to five. And then like, you know, you mm-hmm. always see, you or not see, but like you hear about like, oh man, came home from work and I just like made myself dinner and just sat at the TV until yeah. I like, go to bed. And it's like, I think it's because it's been, so normalized and so yeah. like we're so used to and I mean here in America like it, I mean we have it bad here but like like I've been reading about like in Japan like there's literally a word for these people who overwork themselves so much that they die on their way to work oh and oh, it's like it's yeah. become such a common thing that there's a name for it like wow. it's not like just it happened to one or two people like it's there's, a common mm. reoccurring thing that is yeah. just these people that overwork themselves and I think mm. like we're starting to finally realize like we don't need to do that mm-hmm. like actually I think most I don't know like I feel like okay with the pandemic with everything having to slow down like mm-hmm people that once never had times to like explore hobbies finally like picked up ceramics like the amount yes. of people who like suddenly yes. had ceramics I was like whoa you know? <laughs> know like and it was both exciting but also frustrating because I was like hey man stop buying all the good equipment give me some <laughs> I know because they did like <laughs> wheels were really hard to get yeah, for a while they were so hard <laughs> to get and now they're like I feel like I keep seeing them more and more like kilns yeah. are coming up on like Craigslist and I'm yes. like okay cool cool Cool. I'm I like take keep watching for those because you can always mm-hmm. get a good deal on one. Oh yeah. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for sure. But it was like like people finally were able to slow down. And I mean, I think we I need to like also recognize like my place of privilege here that like I'm yeah. not someone who needs to like, you know, I'm I don't have like a like I have peers that have children, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Like and I don't have a child. I hope I never do, just because mm-hmm. I like don't think I could like I need my dog and that's it you know (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) and like yeah there are people that of course like they need to like unfortunately like we have to or they have to work so hard constantly and like Mm -hmm. we need that to end like Mm -hmm. that's not what life is about like I I don't want to look back and be like oh yeah like 
I spent most of my time like at work, you know, even yeah. though I love what I do, like, yeah, but it's still like, it's not what I, I want my every day to be about. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no, I love that you ask yourself, yourself that like what it, I don't know if it's like, ask yourself, but it just seems like you're in constant conversation with yourself about what it is that matters to you. And then mm -hmm. how, and then how you live a life that, that aligns with what matters to you. Totally. And, and it is this ongoing conversation and mm -hmm. it, and I think that that's so beautiful that you've shared and modeled that in this conversation mm -hmm. too. Cause I think that that's like, people can feel like, oh, that's me being in my head, but actually that's no. you having a conversation with yourself yes, in order absolutely. to check in and to say like, is this where I need to be? Where else, yes. where, where could I be? What, what else might I need instead? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, it's definitely like, this isn't like a practice I've always had, you know, like mm -hmm. this was something I had to like really start. I had to like give myself first off, like it's like a kindness. You have to give yourself a kindness. I think mm -hmm. we're all so quick to immediately judge ourselves and like mm -hmm. immediately think like whatever we're doing is weird. It's silly. Like mm -hmm. it's so weird and crazy to me now that I think about it. Like the idea of like stepping back and thinking like what is healthiest for me mm -hmm. can sometimes be contributed to other people as like that person's selfish. Yeah. Like, it's and I've noticed that in like like that's not it at all like that person's mm -hmm. actually selfless like the yeah. fact that they're they're because when you I feel that when when you are living a life that like you yourself are happy with or you're trying to get towards that happiness like you will treat every other aspect of your life with that kindness and mm -hmm. with that happiness like mm -hmm. since I've started like trying to live more intentionally and trying to live more like really thinking about like is this something that I love you know or is it mm -hmm. something I feel that I just am supposed to be doing mm -hmm. I've like had more leniency on others that like they don't want to yeah. do something they don't like when I see like my friends being unkind to themselves like immediately I jump in and I'm like no dude like would you talk to me like that like you yeah. would never speak to me like yeah. that and they're just like oh my god like you're so right and like talking to them about like I don't know like just I think kindness is, I mean, I don't, I don't think this is a profound thought, but like, like we really just need to be kinder to ourselves, everybody yeah. all around the world. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. and I think it's like, it's so hard nowadays, especially for like younger people that like they're raised on like, you know, like social media. And like, I see mm -hmm. like, young, and I'm talking like younger, younger yeah. like children, like I'm yeah. seeing children that are like, they're day one they have like an iphone you know mm -hmm. and like they are constantly on these apps that like completely like mess with their sense of self with their idea of like what is their importance in the world mm -hmm. and it's just like i think we need to slow down i think that everyone like and honestly the answer like to slow down would fix so many things mm -hmm. it would fix all of the environmental damages that we're putting upon this mm -hmm. earth it will yeah. fix like all of the unnecessary like chaos turmoil that's mm -hmm. like people wanting more and more and more people wanting the best thing you know like mm -hmm. there's just like such a beauty I think in like slowing down chill out like mm -hmm. when you take that moment to slow down you also see things that like you want to fix you know mm -hmm. and like whereas before I think we were also I think like something I've also noticed through like after like you know of course the pandemic it's still but it's it's still there but it's right. very much so I think we have come to realize like this will be here for a while I don't think it's something that's ever going to go away mm -hmm. we just need to change the ways that we you know go about our lives due to like COVID mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that like slowing down has caused is like more people are aware of their surroundings now because they're given the ability to be aware and like yeah Whereas before, like, like there were people that probably their everyday life, sorry, there's a fly that's running around. <laughs> there were people that like their everyday life was like, literally, like I was saying earlier, like wake up, go to work, go get yeah. off work, do anything to help yourself. Like your, your anxiety, you're like tired, you know, like I can't mm -hmm. even imagine like if I'm someone who had like work every single day 
and when I get home, I don't think I would have the energy to be like, I'm going to make art, you know, like, yeah, I would just want to lay in my bed and just like become the moss again, you know, yeah. like, yeah, I don't want to do anything else. And, and now I'm hoping like with everyone kind of like when we had this moment of where the entire world had like sh- shut down and slowed down. I mean, of course, there were a lot of horrible things that happened. A lot of loss happened. Yeah. People had to say goodbye to their loved ones, like through a phone, which yeah. I think is the most inhuman thing ever. And I feel mm-hmm. so heavily for those people. Mm-hmm. But and and like I even had to do like my both of my grandparents passed while I was like stuck here, and I couldn't mm. go get them, go see mm. them overseas. And mm. Mm. they were just like with this ability to now like slow down take observance of your surroundings like I think people are at least the people I know have become kinder people are more aware of the environment also and seeing Mm -hmm. like like I remember um I don't know if like outside of California people people probably heard but like a summer two summers ago or one summer ago when we had that insane wildfire season that Mm -hmm. like it looked like Mars on here. Like mm. the, the sky was so dense. And oh, cloudy. I remember. Smoke. Yeah. Cause um, I was on calls with someone from California. I remember mm-hmm. seeing them and them talking about it. And they showed us one day the, the background of what terrifying. it was like. Yeah. And like, I hope through those moments, like, I hope that people are like not seeing these things and thinking like, Oh my God, like it's too late. Like we have to give up. And yeah. I hope that they're seeing this and being like, at least we can still see this like the fact that we can still see this means we can still change something and Mm -hmm. and I I know also like like climate it's no longer climate change you know it's like climate disaster at this point but like the climate disaster is not the fault of the everyday consumer you know like these are the faults of like bigger companies specifically oil companies that Mm -hmm. then like also like you know like those oil companies also help with like weapons manufacturing and then just all of the evil that goes into like all of those like Mm -hmm. horrible industries that are just that just eat up every human goodness that exists and just spit out all of the crud of humanity you know Mm. and we're just I hope that people are are starting to realize like we can change things and Mm -hmm. there's like this I think like a whole generation of these like angry kids that are coming out that are like we need to make the change you know it's no longer like oh like we have to do it soon it's like it needs to happen now and like and their awareness is just different like I can even mm-hmm. see it in my own children like mm. they are more this, this is such a cheesy little example but like when they're packing their lunch in the morning, they're more Mm -hmm. apt to use the containers that are reusable than a bag because they're just like, well, I can just put it in this container. And Mm -hmm. it's like, they know, and they're like, then we wash it. And it's like, they're young. They're, you know, Mm -hmm. one's just in middle school and the other two are elementary, but just, I think their awareness is so Mm -hmm. much bigger already. And it's not in a, it's not in an, in a way that it's, um, it's not labored. It's just, it's a mm. way of being that they understand yeah. you can be like, it's mm-hmm. not a late, like, it's not like I have to work at this. It's just like, yeah, Mm-mm. got these containers that can be reused. I'm going to use those mm-hmm. and just like things organic like that. And it's easy. Yeah. And it's like, it's just, it's like, no one's forcing them to think these ways, you know? And mm-hmm. I just, I have a lot of hope for like the future just because mm-hmm. of like this strong, headstrong, like younger generation. And I'm saying younger generation, I'm literally 26. Like, <laughs> not that old but I sometimes <laughs> feel like I'm like I'm like I'm the veteran you know I'm like I've been here for decades <laughs> like, you probably have been here for decades before <laughs> this this set of decades that you're in <laughs> yeah sometimes I feel like I'm just like a reincarnated super cool like old no okay not super cool I need to chill out but like, you can say you know, you're the- super cool because you are <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know some like cool old like old like witchy lady who lives yeah. in the hills and like yeah. she has all this wisdom and like I just want to like come down spread wisdom and maybe sell some ceramics go back up with like yeah. a new batch of rice you know oh my gosh that's like the <laughs> sounds like a dreamy way to view right? yourself and live and exist and like mm-hmm. 
and find your per like know your purpose not find your purpose but like know your purpose know your through purpose. that too yeah. yeah like your purpose is here to share mm-hmm. wisdom and to also contribute and to connect and like yeah making making your pottery or ceramics or your art is part of your connecting with with new people and being able to share with that it's like the the gateway door of like hi you like the pottery Mm-hmm. Tell me it goes back to the beginning. They're throwing more. on the wheel. They're throwing on the wheel. <laughs> Tell me your life path. Tell me your life path. Like I straight up, I had like no <sighs> reservations about this, Rhonda. I was like, people would be like mid, like pulling up a wall. And I'm like, so then after you left the military and you found yourself back in university, what did you choose to do? And why did you choose to go the culinary route? You know, like it's- people are just and just noticing how cool everyone is how everyone everyone has like such a beautiful story and like I don't know I just like I I feel very grateful to be like alive and like Mm -hmm. I think it's weird to me to say these things like like on a true moment here um Mm -hmm. like I I was definitely at one point in my life like I was like oh like 21st birthday I don't have to care about that like I won't Mm -hmm. be there you know Mm -hmm. like I Mm -hmm. have that type of thinking yeah yeah and now it's like, like, I'm about to have like my senior show, like, I finished university, finally, something that like, I never thought I would do, like, through my mm-hmm. many years of zip, zip, zipping around and like, mm-hmm. trying things, failing things, quitting things. Mm-hmm. You know? And it just like, all is like, it's just insane to me. Like, I made it like I, I yeah. finally like pushed through and, and like, this is just the beginning. Like, yeah. I once thought like, this is it, you know, like, okay, I I did the university, what next? And like, I'm realizing now, like, that was just the start of everything. Like, yeah, so many doors will open. And like, not just for me, like in a broad speaking, like so many doors Mm -hmm. open for you post graduation. And Mm -hmm. I think what's just important is to like, really remind yourself that like, you're an artist, regardless of like being in an art class, you know, like, you need to continue your art practice. Like, Mm -hmm. There is nothing I think sadder than an artist that's like, uh, and like, and I don't blame them for thinking this way, but like, like for a lot of people, like, you know, okay, you're in this art school, you have facilities to do things, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I don't have a kiln. I don't know how I'm going to fire things without a kiln. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, okay, no, don't fire anything. Start making work that doesn't need to be fired. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm a photographer. I won't have a dark room. How will I make process photos stop do using a dark room just yeah you know like adapt your practice and constantly find new ways to create and Mm -hmm. think of like art does not have to even just be the art piece like I have started to know like I have an amazing professor here and I honestly think without her being like my mentor Mm -hmm. I I don't think I would have been as happy as I am Mm -hmm. like done the things that I've done like Robin Mm -hmm. Hill Mm -hmm. that's my woman she's amazing (laughs) UC Davis, uh, art professor, the best extraordinaire. Mm. And like, she's made me realize like, like an art practice can be like, even like the the washing of a cloth, like yes. is like an art practice. That's maintenance art. Mary, she yeah. always talks about Mary, Mer- Merrily Euclid's Underman. I'm probably butchering that name, but <laughs> you look up maintenance art, she's there. Right. And it's like things like that that like like we need to and I think it's it's really easy as artists that like are you know we're like unfortunately really dependent I think not really dependent but we are dependent on like you know the traction we get on social media sites like Mm -hmm. you know and which is gross like I don't want to live this life anymore but unfortunately until I'm hopefully maybe one day at the point where I can just be like yeah, I make art, whatever, go check it out at like the Met, don't talk to me, you know, like, (laughs) just kidding, I never want to be that artist, but like, at one point, if I could like, make art and not have to be like, here's what I made on Instagram, that would be the dream, because I don't like using it, and it's Mm -hmm. like, it just like, you, you set yourself up to compare, you set yourself up to like, literally like, like, negate all of your importance and put all your worth in like the numbers equation. Yeah. And you move them to an external validation space yeah, rather yes. than and just your own. It goes back to that existing idea instead. Mm-hmm. You move it away from being able to be enough by simply being made, mm-hmm. being there or exactly. having done it. Yeah. It's, yeah. 
and I just I I hope like I don't know there's I think I think there's gonna be like a like some sort of like renaissance coming up I don't know you just Mm -hmm. like you feel it in the air you know like yeah I think people are starting to realize like the ways we've been conducting like our work lives is too much like Mm -hmm. we need to start caring about the earth more people Mm -hmm. need to start caring about like you know their entire community including like the poc and black and indigenous lives in that Mm -hmm. community and Mm -hmm. i don't know i just i i have a lot of hope for the future and Mm -hmm. like there are days when it's like super hard to be alive and it's super hard to like exist and Mm -hmm. i just want to like just you know pause it all yes <laughs> like just I just want like the click you know click the movie with the yes remote. yeah I want we that just, sometimes yes and I just want to click click pause and just take a nap like yeah. just sleep to rest and then but then it's like those moments pass and I don't dwell in those moments you know and I mm-hmm. realize like yeah like today sucked but that doesn't mean tomorrow has to suck you know right right and yeah it's a it, it's a reminder that everything is temporary yes like mm-hmm. truly nothing I don't even know the only thing like they always say what the only thing that's constant is change or something like that and there's mm, truth to that totally. but just like just a reminder I think I do say that as a mantra from time to time like just remember it's temporary like mm-hmm. this is like or like if I'm trying to decide something like this is a temporary decision mm-hmm. and temporary can mean five minutes it can mean 10 years but it's still yep. temporary because it's it temporary. will change Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't a permanent moment. So I was thinking... I was looking at our time too, and I was like, yes. we have to fit. I want to be mindful because you have stuff to do today. We're getting <laughs> set up. So what I think we'll do is we'll um we'll go to stu- what I call studio time wrap up, which is a series mm-hmm. of questions that I ask each person as we end okay. the as we end this um session, if you will, or conversation. And Beautiful. so the the first one is a finish the sentence. And it is when I don't know what to create or make, I I definitely will go for a walk. Mm. I always go for a walk. And mm-hmm. I think that like having Saya also has like really, I noticed cause I was thinking, this is funny you're saying this. I hope I can like expand on this, but yeah, I'm not ab- please do. I, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. I forgot to say that you can talk <laughs> as much about each one as you want or as little about each one as you want. Yes, uh, please so, expand. Like, <laughs> I just like, I started thinking about, cause I was having a conversation with my mother who is like, I just like call your elders like anytime you feel any like like if you don't have like um you know like if you're you don't have a parent or a relative to go to just call an older person that you look up to like I just Mm -hmm. think it's so important in life to have elders and have Mm -hmm. mentors yeah and I was having this day that it was it was a pretty hard day for me mental health wise and like stress wise like Mm-hmm. I just had a lot of deadlines coming up there. It just felt like everything I was doing was going wrong. And I just like broke down. And I had this moment where I was, I was like literally bawling my eyes out on a, mm-hmm. like, I was just in my car in the parking lot of the next place I had to go to. Mm-hmm. And I remember just like looking over and I saw like a group of people playing volleyball and I like lost my mind. And I was like, I just want to play volleyball. <laughs> 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 I like had this moment where I just was like oh my god like I want that too and like uh, I called my mom and I was like dude like what the hell's going on like there's no re- like there's no yeah. reason for me to watch people play volleyball and like be so emotionally distraught <laughs> and she was like Zahra like you haven't given your chance a moment to do anything for you like why are you not doing anything just for you and I realized mm. like in that moment like she was right like I don't give myself this moment of just my time and Mm. I've started this practice now that like anytime I feel stuck like artistically or I don't know what to create or even like stuck mentally and Mm -hmm. life-wise like I I always have taken my dogs on walks right Mm. but I used to always like listen to podcasts that were like you know 
like survival podcast or medical <laughs> malpractice podcast. I just like <laughs> like stress inducing podcasts. Yeah, like I was yeah. listening to all these things that would stress me out, and I would be like, <sighs> like, does he make it down the Everest? Ah, and then the guy like dies, and I'm like going crazy too. And I'm just like, why am I doing this? And I like, <laughs> I like started this practice of like now when I go for a walk, like. I will eat if I am going to listen to music I will only listen to like like um there's like a type of music that's like known in like the Sufi religion which is like Mm -hmm. a mystical sector of Islam Mm -hmm. and it's these people that like they really believe and it's something that I've been looking in like looking into more and thinking like man like I know I believe in God and like these things and but like I don't know if I'm necessarily a Muslim and I started learning about Sufis which are Muslim people but they're a mystical more spiritual sector Mm. of islam and like they have this type of music that's this repetitive beautiful like sounds of the drums and the sitar and it's Mm. just this repet like repetition and i notice like without the words without all of the stress of like other people's near-death experiences like i just listen to that and i just like walk my dog and I don't Mm. touch my phone until we're like back in the house yep and I usually do like a 40 minute walk and she loves it I love it and it's like Mm -hmm. my moment to just like let my brain shut down observe and just Mm -hmm. like like that's my me time you know Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. it's just 40 minutes out of my day but I'm hoping once I graduate like it can be like two hours out of the day yeah yeah Well, there's some, there's like actually science behind it too, that I was learning about from another podcast episode that when you're walking, it has to do with the way your eyes need to move side to side or something as you're walking to scan. And that there's something with that action that like it does things in your brain to sort of reset. Yeah. So there's like scientific research you could Google it. And, uh, but that, that proves why going for a walk when you're stressed is a really good thing to do because it does help your brain reset. Wow. I did not know that. that I just so learned magical. it this year. And I was wow. like, I love that there's a, like that there's science behind why this is so good because that's mm-hmm. an intuitive thing that I do too, mm-hmm. is just go for the walk. Like the walk yep. clears, just clears, just clears, clears the thinking. Yep. And like, yeah. and then you get inspired by like other, and it, of course it depends on like where your environment is. Like, I'm sure my walks would be different if I like lived in like a more urban space or sure. if I lived in a totally rural space, like, but it, it's, it's just, it's so important, I think. And mm-hmm. also to just like get yourself moving. Like I used to be like really into having like a daily yoga practice. And then like mm-hmm. recently it's just like, I don't give myself that time anymore. And yeah, I think what's good about like having Saya is like, I'm like, I have to give myself this time. Yes. Like I can't not take this dog for a walk. Like that's so evil, you know? Right. Right. Whereas like for the yoga, it's like, of course it's like, well, this is me, me time, you know, like, yeah. this is just for me. And thankfully though, I'm, I'm going to get back into that once I get more time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you were talking about the music on your walk too, that's a really good transition because the next one is about the songs that you shared. (laughs) So I asked each person to share five songs that you could listen to on repeat in your studio or anytime. And so I'm going to list the songs with the um, musician. I'm going to do my best to pronounce things as Mm -hmm. best I can. And then I'm going to ask you a question about them afterwards. Okay. So your first song you had was Be Careful by Green Tea Peng. Mm -hmm. and Prelude by Ali Azimi Mm -hmm. and Lamp Lady by Sevdaliza. That's very close. Yes. Okay. How would you say it? Sevdaliza. Sevdaliza. Okay. Oh, I see where it should have. Okay. I see the syllable. Um, It Never Rains Here, Mortiza by Kiosk or Morteza. Mm -hmm. Mortiza. Mortiza. Mm -hmm. And then No Bus by Lofili. Yeah. Lofile. Lofile. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Could you share how these songs contribute to your creative flow? Totally. Um, I would say, so three of those were um, Iranian artists. So Mm -hmm. Sandaliza is a Danish Iranian artist Mm. and um, Lamp Lady specifically. I think I love that song because after I, I like read about what the song's about, it's about cheap, you know, like her guilt of like, like, wow, like my parents immigrated to Denmark, right? Danish people are from Denmark. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My parents immigrated to Denmark and like, 
like what is the life I would have had like if they stayed over there like mm. am I doing the things that I should be doing here like am I mm. re- putting respect upon their name is this honoring their like mm-hmm. their attempts to like give me a better life mm-hmm. and so I listen to that constantly because it's just I I really resonate with it and it's mm-hmm. also a beautiful and very like um I don't know it's such I listen yeah song. it's yeah. enchanting right yeah like, all of her music is very um there's something very I'm gonna say the word again but enchanting about them like mm. she puts you into this trance like space like they're mm-hmm. very like the melodies the beats and it's like it's almost like, like this repetitive like waves crashing mm-hmm. how I can like describe her music the best and then mm-hmm. group be careful by green tea paying it's just I love green tea paying so much mm-hmm. she's so or I do believe they go by they actually mm-hmm. they are a very inspirational and amazing musician that mm-hmm. has this like I don't know how to describe their music it's just again like almost trancing and like they have a lot of you know south asian roots in their music and be careful is kind of about like i don't know like thinking about how can we like go about our days having the i don't how would i describe it without like totally repeating everything we've been talking about like being like (laughs) that's the beauty of it though yeah yeah, it's all connected circles back and like yeah it's just this like I feel like when I listen to their music they really help me think about like protecting my peace and like Mm. protecting my own self self self-worth and like Mm -hmm. thinking about what I want to feel and how I want to be like treated in the world Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then Prelude by Ali Azizimi is my first uh song that like got me into contemporary like Iranian music that's Mm -hmm. not like you know, like, I was raised listening to, like, Gugush, Daryush, like, Shahram Nanzari. These are all, like, classic, like, you know, the stuff, like, my parents would listen to. And it was uh-huh. always, like, really beautiful music. But it wasn't, mm-hmm. like, something I could, like, like, the, sometimes they were too slow. Sometimes they were just, they just sounded too dated for me. And mm-hmm. I didn't feel like it was, like, this fresh, young, contemporary Iranian like idea that I I wanted to connect with you know Mm -hmm. yeah and so that song was the first song I ever heard that I was like holy crap like Iranians are making music like this Mm -hmm. like you know Mm -hmm. I never because also like making music in Iran is like so it's very difficult like there are some Mm -hmm. genres that are literally like illegal like Mm -hmm. you can't really practice like metal you know like any metal band is immediately like garnered like satanic satanic or you know yeah. And so there's a lot of like propaganda and a lot of like restrictions. And so I just always assumed like no one was making music like that. And, mm-hmm. and then I found that song and it's it's such a beautiful song. It's a love story. And the mm-hmm. music video, I think like you have to watch the music video. I would have you know, to look it up. Yeah. You have to. It's amazing. They used like clips from um like old and contemporary Iranian cinema and meshed it together to make this like uh, the the breakdown in that song just like when the everything like you know in the music when it's like tingling up your back and yes it's, like, it's stuck right there for a moment yeah and, then you go, and it like all just like every pore of mine releases with like ecstasy mm. when I listen to it it's just mm. so so beautiful and I just like after I found that then I found all of these other like amazing Iranian bands and it just like got me feeling closer and closer to my culture and mm-hmm. and then that's what um it never rains here mortiza is mm-hmm. like it's like a funny song that's like this guy is very he's very like old like grungy jazzy and he's mm-hmm. like talking it's like both talking he talks a little bit in english and then he talks a little bit in farsi but it's like he's basically like this like disgruntled like you know worker who's like complaining about his boss and like he's the rain is a symbol of like wealth you know and Mm -hmm. he's like telling his friend Mortiza he's like no matter how much I work this old boss is always up my ass like (laughs) you know of course he's saying it in Farsi and it's like beautiful and poetic but like that's the gist of it is like it's like but like very not so much like very like like the best way I could describe it is like 
Jazzy Johnny Cash almost. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Jazzy Johnny Cash. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it just makes me feel so like, mm-hmm, but like, mm-hmm. and it's just, I love it so much. And then mm. I forget, there was one more song, correct? Oh, uh, No Bus by Lo-Fi? No Bus is just, it's, it's a song that I'm recently more into that mm-hmm. is, honestly, I don't even know what they're talking about in the lyrics. I just love the way that it sounds. <laughs> it's just like one of the songs that like I've found like, like I used to very much so be a very like self, I'm still pr- pretty self-conscious, but not mm-hmm. as much as I used to be. And a lot of it had to be with like, like my body and stuff. And I yeah. used to never really like allow myself to, you know, jazz out and dance. Cause I was like, man, like I don't have like a pretty skinny ballerina body. Like mm. no one wants to see this body dance, you know? Oh. And, like now I'm in this place where I'm like, I'm a beautiful woman. That's and right. Like, yeah. Like I'm going to dance. And like, that's one of the songs that like, if I play that in my car or when I'm walking or anything, like I have to like bust some moves out. Cause it's just like, it's so like the, just the way the song like flows is so like beautiful to me. And every I have genuinely no idea what he's saying, but it sounds so good. But it sounds so good. And every, so good. like, it's such a remind, everybody, everybody deserves to dance. And yes, like, everybody, did, I just watched, um, Lizzo's big girls on Amazon with mm-hmm. my, my kids and I were watching it. And it's, it is focused on that too, that like, doesn't matter what size your body is like you Mm -hmm. can dance and she's specifically looking for dancers who aren't the stereotypical body that ever and like all these women are sharing like I wasn't supposed to dance like I'm it's just what you said I'm the body that isn't meant to be isn't supposed to be dancing isn't supposed Mm -hmm. to be moving in these ways and yet you absolutely should be like why is that held off from anyone we're all allowed to move and dance everyone yeah and like yeah and it just again like comes with this like this like radical self-love that I feel like I've been like trying to instill in myself and like Mm -hmm. I hope like more and more like specifically like female female identifying people like Mm -hmm. so this is totally still a patriarchal world even though it's Mm -hmm. definitely not like Mm -hmm. the world's a woman you know (laughs) we all came from women and like Mm -hmm. women are so powerful and but yet Mm -hmm. you know men will always rule the world Mm -hmm. until like you know I think it's going to be taken back soon yeah it's shifting it's shifting. yes absolutely yeah okay my next question is what brings you joy in your creative life Ooh, Mm, that's such a good one I think I think experimentation I think Mm -hmm. there's nothing more exciting to me and joyful for me then experimentation and seeing like what and now like I'll do one thing and then I'm like what's next you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like what else can I explore what what other material is going to speak to me what other concept is interesting to me and I think also another thing that brings me joy is definitely definitely when I can tell that like if I'm making some sort of interactive or social practice piece that it's like it's changed people's days like oh yeah. I have a perfect example for that actually I had this one art like a social practice piece I did that I went around Davis and I planted uh black eyed Susans in like random like spots on oh. some frat lawns and then and then, then like <laughs> some like schoolyards I planted it in the central park I planted one in like this like bare like roundabout area mm-hmm and then I, I just like, I dressed up like a construction worker. Like I made it all legit. Like I put like on a, like a maintenance vest, like a high vis vest, like project liberation flowers. And I like had this whole, like I had a spiel that if anyone asked me what I would do, I would just be like, I'm here on behalf of project liberation flowers. I have nothing further to discuss. And I would just like, you know, it was like a whole act. And I would like plant these flowers that then were like you know grounds people just all like oh well this flower is here we should water it now and like people mm. started to water them and I found out one of them a couple of them because they were like I did go on like you know frats lawns and those are technically private property to the frat but like mm. and they took it out because like I don't think frat boys want to like water a flower every morning yeah you know? maybe they do I'm maybe being close-minded I'm being close-minded maybe they'd be ready for it yeah, maybe they'd be ready, but they took that one out. They took out my one in Central Park, but I had one that was in this corner between like a, like a park, a different park, and then a school. 
but I guess like the school had thought it was actually one of their flowers Aww. and they had watered it they were taking care of it Rhonda this went from like one one stem flower just one uh-huh. Uh-huh. and literally now it's a bush like it's a giant bush like a flower bush and also I found out later black-eyed Susans are a symbol for like justice and yeah. so like to me that's just even more exciting and I would get like texts from friends that they're like dude just pick some flowers for my house from your bush and like, like it's like something that's giving you know like I, yeah. I love to give like a lot of my pieces have to have some sort of part of them that people can take with them I just mm-hmm. think that brings me a lot of joy is just like mm. maybe is it like my nosy little like raccoon self that just like <laughs> I want to be in people's houses you know <laughs> or like, like I just like <laughs> like I find myself like questioning like am I actually like is it the joy I bring them that I love or is it the like mischievousness of being everywhere like, you know, I think it's, it's probably little, both yeah, yeah I think totally it's a little both. bit of both and then, mm-hmm. yeah so I think definitely what brings me joy is experimentation and also just like seeing how people interact and mm-hmm. being able to like you know make like that special moment like the fact that someone like it gets they get joy out of their day because they know they're gonna walk past my flower yeah. and then they can like cut themselves a bouquet and that's like like there's nothing more exciting than that you know mm. and you get like it makes me think about a couple different things but just like you gave them something to take care of mm. and and that when we give people something to take care of more often than not we can entrust them to take care of it mm-hmm. and that we don't always do that very often to give people the care of something else like fully mm. give it and then also when you give when you give something sweet or kind like just that 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 people receive that in ways that go beyond what you initially even thought it could be mm-hmm. more often too. I feel like that's a, another experience that happens. Like when you do something, mm-hmm. it often exceeds what you think is possible. Mm-hmm. And that that's a gift as an artist too, is like that your art can go, can exceed beyond what you think is possible. Yes, absolutely. You, yeah. you nailed it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, you're so good with your words. That's something I'm car- currently working on is I mm. think I need to build my vocabularies. Mm. I, yeah, you know, I, I think you're beautiful with your words. So I'm kind of like, I don't think, I think that you have it already. And it's just that you need to recognize that you already have it. And like that, the, mm. your, your version of how you tell your stories and your way you think and process your life. Like it's all already there in it's most beautiful, glorious form. Like it's already there. Amanda, thank you so much. That is so sweet and kind. Oh, it's so true. I really need to hear that. Like the day before this nerve wracking show. Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> remember that. Like, you know, like from talking with you always, but in today too, like you know, your work, you know, your intention it's there and you can, Mm. you can speak it. Like when you speak from your place of heart and knowing and all like it's, it's all there. Mm. You should never doubt that it's there. Thank you. I won't. I won't. Yeah. It's there. Well, the very last question for you Mm -hmm. is a finish the sentence again. Mm -hmm. And it's my creativity is I think my creativity is it's constantly it's constantly growing I think mm-hmm. and it's constantly finding like new ways to like show up in my life mm. and I I think it's it's honestly like I think my favorite part of existing is being a creative person that exists you know mm-hmm. I do rec- like there are sometimes like it's I think creativity is kind of hard like it's really Mm -hmm. hard to like think of ideas and it's hard to like not only think of them but then figure out how to make it like not just this thing in your mind and like actually this like tactile thing others and yourself can observe and yeah and I think that it's I think my creativity is like my my reason for living like Mm -hmm. I just like I literally cannot imagine myself doing anything else like I have tried even with farming like Mm -hmm. I always told myself like 
like well, not always I had the moment where I was like art sucks <laughs> and then that was just like you're willing to so throw angsty. it away for a little bit <laughs> yeah for a little bit when I was like a little angsty teenager and then <laughs> but now I'm like like I even with farming like like I always had this idea like I'll have this farm that's also an art studio like yeah. everything always has art like it yeah. needs to there needs to be and creativity goes beyond just like a art piece right right like creativity is how we how we fill up our time creativity is how we dress ourselves how we how we speak to others how we decide to go about our days like I think mm-hmm. creativity is everywhere I, yeah. I think some people maybe aren't just a just harness theirs in a different way because I Mm -hmm. really believe every person's creative Mm -hmm. I just don't think every person unfortunately can harness that you know yeah or even recognize it as something that I think I've been I've been feeling like that a lot lately is like I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people can't even recognize when their own Mm -hmm. creativity is alive and moving like you know I think of my own creativity sometimes in like the smallest of weird moments of like like I'm looking out my studio window and I'm seeing this overgrown grass at the moment. And like, just the way that that moves, that becomes a creative thought. Cause then it's like, mm. how could I repeat that movement in a piece? And what would that mm. movement relate to something mm-hmm. else? Like that, that's my creativity. And like, like a lot of times we don't think that that is our creativity, like no. a little moment like that, but that's our mind playing and imagining something more than what is just in front of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Zahra, this is so beautiful to speak with you today. And just, I'm so glad we got to have this time together on a selfish note. <laughs> oh, no, not at all selfish. I've had such an amazing time, Rhonda. It has been so nice to hear your voice again and the warmth that like you are just a radiant person. And oh, I'm, gosh. I'm extreme. I'm, I'm serious. I'm extremely, I think, lucky to know you and mm-hmm. like you're, extremely generous in all sorts of ways like Mm. I don't think like any I met a lot of people that summer and I think you are one of the ones that I will never ever forget and I never want to forget and I know you're stuck with me (laughs) you're stuck with me for years to come sorry (laughs) yes good no please not sorry (laughs) (laughs) like you I'm I'm just I'm so grateful to be a part of this and be a part of your life and I mm. can't wait to see like what else you do and I can't mm. wait to hear like the other podcasts and everything mm. oh thank you so much thank you so much for your time and congratulations on this next step and welcome to your next quarter life crisis yes I can't wait <laughs> your next opening of things my, yeah my next opening I'm gonna like I'm gonna try to harness it in the way like Maybe I'll just start wearing like bright colors or something. Yeah. Like, I'm going to try to like lessen the extremities I go to. I tend yeah. to be really extreme. Huh. So I think maybe I'll do brighter earth tones, but not brighter like, earth not tones. The earth tones. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like maybe I'll throw in some orange or yellow or, you know, like <laughs> just stretch so far. Yeah. I'm <laughs> super crazy here. <laughs> oh. Let's take inspiration from Zahara and think about where our contemplation stations are in our lives. Make a list of them. If you can't think of any, then ask yourself to find two contemplation stations this week. Maybe go to one of your places and write a personal sacred secret. Then burn it, releasing it. Feeling bold or needing to investigate? Ask a stranger or person in your life that you admire about their life path. What brought them to their current place? And remember, as you approach your creativity, let the universe do a breath of the work for you. I loved when Zahara shared this phrase in our conversation. Let the universe do a breath of the work for you. My sincere gratitude to each of my guests this season for entrusting me with co-sharing their stories. My heart is so full from each of these conversations and my joyful appreciation to everyone who has listened and who will listen to the podcast. I hope you have discovered yourself within these conversations. If you enjoy the podcast, please share it and rate and review wherever you listen to your podcast. 
The podcast will continue to be available throughout the summer and off season. I might pop in with a few brief bonus episodes here and there before the 2023 season launches. Follow the podcast on our website, Instagram, or through Spotify and Apple Podcasts for updates. Before I end the inaugural season, I want to invite each of you to share your responses to My Creativity Is. Head to the podcast website, theartistinmeisdeadpodcast.com, and add your response on the homepage by scrolling down. As always, thank you so much for joining me this season. Until next season, bye.